find the line such that if you look at all these distances to a subspace that you found, so, that, so your data set um, was an RD, and this subspace here is um, K dimensional, um, where K is hopefully much less than D, then it looked at all these, all these distances. Right, you call this distance RP. Uh, um, this is like the residual, and this minimized um, the, um, the sum over all the points of uh, the length of RP squared. Okay, so it's, it's finding the subspace which minimizes the sum of the, of the squared residuals, and the residuals are projected onto the closest point in the subspace. So we'll come back to uh, regression um, on Monday next week. And that's looking at, and that instead is looking at um, something similar. You're minimizing the sum of the squared residuals, but those are um, the vertical projections. Um, and so that's going to be a different sort of area. And we'll talk about the trade-offs of why you want to do either the the closest point projection or the vertical projection, always in this, uh, always going this direction. Um, when we come back to that, but the the thing I want to point out now is that this is minimizing a sum of these things, which means that it's it's not guaranteeing that every single point is going to be captured well. So it's saying that the average, essentially, the average squared distance is smaller. The average distance of these is smaller. Um, but it, it could be that you have one of these of these of these data points, which is way out here, and uh, so this projection is is far here. But most of them are small. But there's one that's really big, um, and so in in most cases this is this is this is probably good, good trade-off. You want to capture the core of the structure, and you'll sometimes have have these outlier points. Right? And you want to not worry too much about the outlier points. And occasionally, if there's a point very far from everything else, then that's probably OK. Um, and we'll talk, in fact, next week about how to do even, even better um, um, about dealing with these, these uh, especially with these <coughs> kind of outlier points. Um, but uh, but in, in some cases, what you want to do is you want to go from um, from RD, where this is this very high dimensional space, to um, um, to RK, um, which is a much lower dimensional space, where again K is supposed to be much less than D, right? And you want to do this and preserve um, all distances. Um, and so, in fact. Whoa, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at some map um, U, which is it is going to take a point from R D and and uh, and put it in a subspace R R K, where this subspace is in particular, you know, is a subset of R D. And what the property that we want is that if you look at um, for all pairs of points in P, that if you look at the distance um, the distance between these two pair, um, and you and if you look at the distance, or if you look at the distance between um, mu P and mu P prime, right, so, so this is the distance in RD, this is the distance in RK, in the k-dimensional space. And what you want is you're going to get some epsilon amount of distortion. So this is going to be the distortion factor. And so, so this distance is always going to be, if you, if you multiply it by this 1 minus epsilon, so something a little bit less than 1, so think like 0.9. If you multiply it by 0.9, then then this distance times 0.9 is less than this distance. So it's not, so this, this one can't be too much, um, this one can't be too much smaller than this one. That's what this says. You also want to say on the other side, 1 plus epsilon 
minus p prime. So it also, this one can't be too much um, larger, or let's see, uh, this one can't be too much smaller than this distance too, um, because if it was, um, or it, it, if it's, or it, this one can't be too much larger than the original distance either, right? So, um, because if it was too much larger than this was say, um, times 1.1, so if I put in some numbers here, so this is, you know, times 0 0.9 and times 1.1. So if you multiply the original distance by a small amount, then it's always going to be larger than the projected distance. And if you multiply it by uh, a amount a little bit less than one, it's always going to be smaller. So this is sandwiched by some approximation of the true distance. And the key point is that this is going to hold for all of the pairs of points in your set. So for all points in your set, you want to guarantee that it's close. So this, this is, the, the reason why this may be interesting is you're trying to run some sort of analysis on your data. You're trying to um, find like the closest pairs, uh, the, the closest point in your, in your data set. And it, you want some property where um, you're okay if the distance, your similarity search thing is off by some, some epsilon factor, some small factor. Um, um, so you, you want to, but because these similarity search things don't work very well in high dimensions, sort of these cursive dimensionality we talked about um, before, you want it to be in some lower dimensional space where this is going to work better. And so it's important that if you were to project this point here, then you're going to be very far off in the distance in this one for this one point, and you could be totally off in some sense. Um, in, in what, what the distance was. Or, but if you have this sort of guarantee, then you're, you're still going to have some approximation on every single distance. And so for some cases, this is going to be more useful approximation like this than it, than it will be where you're preserving like the average distance. Okay? So, okay, so, so, this is, so what this is called, this is called a um, low distortion um, embedding. And the, the idea is you're taking a point set, which is in some um, very high dimensional space, and embedding it in some very low dimensional space. So, and it's, so what we're going to, um, so this is something that I'm going to, so okay, so, so I'm going to talk for the first part of the lecture today, talk about what's called the johnson lindenstrauss lemma, um, which tells you a very simple randomized algorithm, how it actually constructs uh, 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 such an embedding. And it's pretty much, it's very simple and randomized, and it's pretty much as good as you can do. Um, so then the next part of the, and I'll only spend maybe 10, 15 minutes on this part. And then the second part, I'll talk about um, compressed sensing. Um, and and uh, one of the kind of simplest algorithms to use for the compressed sensing problem called um, orthogonal uh, uh, a matching pursuit. And so why am I putting these, these together in um, one lecture? Um, well, so uh, maybe that's a good question, but uh, so I, I, I like to think of it as the, the, the Johnson-Lenstrauss lemma, which we'll talk about first, shows how, the, and both of these the idea is that you need to use these randomized techniques, and very simple randomized techniques that will uh, allow you to get some very uh, um, powerful results. And in this case, we're going to be um, doing very simple technique to embed it in a lower dimensional subspace, and the compressed sensing will use randomization to allow us to recover um, structure from a very large but extremely noisy data set. And so the randomness is key in, in for both of these um, for both of these techniques to work. Okay. Um, okay. So what is the Johnson Lenstrauss law? Um, So it's called a, um, so this was, they proved it in 1985, and this was, 
part of a larger paper, which I don't remember what the larger paper was on, but this was just some small lemma that they had in the paper. But this lemma has turned out to be useful on a lot of other things. So like a lemma is like a small part of a big theorem. But you know, this really, this has more, had more impact than what they were trying to prove in the, in the first place, what, their, what they thought their main result was. Um, and what the idea was that if you took, um, take k random um, dimensions um, and um, project p, um, so we'll call this subspace f, and, and project p onto and this is this is equal to you know it's it's a k-dimensional space and project p onto f um, and um, this defines um, on this map mu which which we want to define this low distortion embedding and so this works if k is equal to one over epsilon squared log n over delta so it works with probability 1 minus delta. So to randomize, there's some delta probability that something horribly wrong will happen. But, um, but so it's, um, okay. So let's let's break this down a little bit. So we're going to project onto these k um, random dimensions. Um, so how does this work? How do you create um, just one random dimension? So so let's say one random um, dimension. Um, so how do we create a random dimension in a d-dimensional space? What does it mean to create a random dimension? Just one set of random, random numbers? Like a row? What? Um, a, yes, a um, uniform random dimension. So it's not just a set of random numbers, but think of, you know, think of something like R3, right? So this is three-dimensional space of the room. And one dimension is, is um, one line, right? One subspace, right? So the board is two dimensions, but there's another two dimensions that runs, you know, along this line and mapping out. One dimension, if I point, that's defining one dimension. So how do I pick one dimension at random and uniformly at random? You pick Gaussian. Right, right. That's um, that's exactly right. So you um, um, you generate a um, Gaussian um, random um, variable in Rd. Right, so, so, so I look at a, a, a Gaussian in D dimensions, and I pick a random point from this Gaussian. And, and we talked about how to do this earlier, and this was actually the third part of the, of the homework, which uh, most of you did. Um, and uh, so it, it, you generated these random D dimensional Gaussians, and so let's, um, let's call this um, um, G, and this is from, um, some Gaussian, you know, with uh, 0, 1, you know, and it's a d-dimensional Gaussian, right? So it, it, it doesn't matter how you normalize or whatever, because then the next step you're going to do is you're going to say that u is, is going to be equal to this. This is a point in a d-dimensional space. We're going to treat it as a vector, and we're going to normalize it. So th this, this makes sure that the length of this vector is 1. Okay, so um, this is one random direction. Now we need to take all of our points P and somehow um, project them onto this onto this random direction. And what we do is so for um, for all um, P in in this, in this point set, um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, Create a point QI 
which is going to be equal to the um, going to be equal to the dot product of p um, with um, with ui. If if this was the we're going to do this k times, and this is the ith one that we did, right? So we're going to take this this random direction. So you can think of having some point here p, and we're going to pick this random direction. Um, so let's see, it's, it's actually this is going to be a unit vector here, right? And so we can ex extend this, pretend this unit vector defines a line, and when you project it, you're really just taking the dot product, right? So, so, so when I did this, this projection, this is going to be the point qi that corresponds to p. <coughs> so this is the point, but this, this, uh, this dot product only gave me, a, this is a scalar, right? A dot product is a scalar. This is just giving me um, this, uh, um, what this distance is here. So I've got one value out of here. And so this value is going to be the height coordinate. So think of this as being the, the height axis of this, of this uh, k-dimensional subspace. And the value along this axis, or along this coordinate then, it's like a rotated coordinate space, is going to be, in this case, maybe it's minus 0.8. Right, so it's, it's going to be a negative value. So you project it down out here. And this gives me the i coordinate. And I do this k times, and I get k different coordinates. Um, so then you repeat, you know, you just repeat this k times. And by repeating this k times, you get k coordinates for every one of these points, and this this gives you a point in this uh, uh, um, in this k-dimensional space. Okay, so I'm I'm almost done. Um, you need to one other thing that I skipped. You're going to need to multiply this by d over k. This this value. You're going to need to scale this up by, by d over k. The reason why you need to do this is that whenever you are, are projecting something, this used to have a length here, now its length is going to be smaller. And in fact, you expect, it, you expect the length to be uh, um, 1 over d of, or you expect the squared length to be 1 over um, d of what it used to be. Right, so, so because you can decompose it along these orthogonal axes. So, so the expected, if you took a random direction out of these d directions, you expect the squared length to have 1 over d fraction of that along this direction. And that's what's captured by here. Um, so when we're doing this k times, that means that we're shrinking each of these coordinates, so we need to scale them, scale them back up so they have the right expected. Okay, so, so this, is, this is a very simple algorithm. And in the homework, you've already implemented the, the, maybe the hardest part, although it's not, it shouldn't be that hard. This is just the Box Mueller transform with the, um, with the uniform random variables. Give you this, and then you do this normalization. You take the dot product, and you can usually skip the normalization step even, because if you get it in the right expectation, you scale it up, and you do this k time, you get a low dimensional substance. And this is going to give you this low distortion effect. So just randomly projecting, which turns out to be very easy to do, will give you a good subspace which captures it. Okay, so the algorithm is really simple, but let's look at this, this bound here. And this bound, people have, have, mathematicians have proven that this is essentially as good as you can do, even if you didn't use a randomized algorithm. I guess you could get rid of this delta term here, but you essentially need one rest one squared log n of these, these dimensions. Okay, what's, what's really cool about this? The number of dimensions does not depend on, on um, does not depend on d, on the original dimension of the space. It's completely independent of that. It only depends on the amount of air you want in your embedding, which is this epsilon term, and the number of points that you have here. 
So this n is the size of p. Right? So it only depends on the number of points and the error that you care about. And it depends only uh, on logarithmically on the number of points. So you know, as the number of points grows very quickly, you still only really need about a logarithmic number of dimensions in order to capture most of the variation of every single pair of points. Uh, um, so this is really cool. Um, so I, for instance, in, in some of the research I've done, um, there's there's some there's these these uh, these feature spaces you can use in machine learning, which actually have um, they actually have an infinite number of dimensions. Um, that maybe it doesn't really make sense, um, but you, if you think you have an infinite number of dimensions, you can still use something like this technique because when you project it down, the number of dimensions is now finite. And this had no dependence on what the original number of dimensions was. So you couldn't quite do this directly because you needed to, but, but there was a way you could use a technique like this which didn't depend on the dimension. So if you're in like a million dimensional space, you can project down to some lower dimensional space. That only depends on the number of points that you have. Okay, so, so that's the really cool part. This has um, no dependence on, on D, on the dimension. Unfortunately, it also has this 1 over epsilon squared term here. And that means for, say, 10% error here, so for between 0.9 and, and 1.1 were these factors here, which is it's not really too bad in the scheme of things, but if I wanted this, this term alone is going to be about 100, right? So if epsilon is 0.1, then 1 over epsilon squared is, is 100. Um, and if you wanted 1% error, then this is going to be 10,000. It's really big. Um, and in practice, um, and, and then you still have to worry about this log n term, right? Um, in practice, if you care about a, a, um, a small dimensional if, this, if going down to say 100 dimensions, or like 200 dimensions is okay, um, then, then, this is a, then this technique works really well, it's really easy, and it's really fast to use. Um, so, um, so, so, so this works well um, for say k equals um, say 200. Right, so if you're willing to go down to 200 dimensions, then, then this will work well. And so in some applications in machine learning, you can think of this as now some feature space with only 200 features you care about. And that will really capture everything about your data. Um, you could have had some infinite number of features you could have generated, but there really are only 200 that matter. And, and this is for, you know, bounded number of points. So that if the number of points grows up, the number this would increase to does not increase too much. So the subspace that you care about, you know, there's really only some log n dimensional subspace which, which matters with this large constant factor. And that's kind of a cool fact about high dimensional data. The other thing is, this, this algorithm, I computed this map mu, right, this map mu by these random dimensions without looking at my data. So this also, um, so this does not um, depend on, on the data, which is very different than what happened with PCA. With PCA, it was all about the data. I looked at the data, I computed something of it, and this completely determined my vectors. And so that's why it can do, it. in fact, for lower dimensional things, it works much better. If you're going down to two dimensions, you want to use PCA. This one's going to have too much noise in it. But this one doesn't even depend on the, on the original data. Just these random projections will tend to work pretty well. Okay, so I, I'm actually not going to say anything more about this. The proof, you can, you can get pretty close to the right proof with just the Chernoff bound and the union bound we talked about earlier on in class. We're just doing these repeated trials. Um, and that gives you the error, but I'm going to, I'm apparently teaching for Suresh in his computational geometry class on Tuesday, and 
he's asked me actually to prove this, so I'm going to prove this in more detail, or at least um, up to some resolution and talk about other variants of it. So if you're interested, next Tuesday you can come to the geometry class and find out pretty much you know why this works. Uh, question? Um, it turns out you don't. No. Um, so in some of the early proofs, they enforced that they were going to be orthogonal. So what you can do is you can pick k of them, and then you can orthogonalize them using that same projection matrix I talked about uh, on Monday. But it turns out that even if they're not enforced to be orthogonal, they're still probably going to work pretty well. In practice, they will actually be very close to being orthogonal if d is large enough. Um, just based on how random things, how random high dimensions work. But you, but you don't actually don't need to enforce that. In fact, you can replace this with with a um, with in, in, instead with the with the point G that's in a um, that's in a space. It's it's as a as a d-dimensional vector where each element is minus one zero or plus one at random. You can actually do this, and the, and the result still works. Um, the, the, this was kind of a cool surprise that came out. Like this was like in '85, and then 10 years ago, someone said, "Oh, you can just do this," and and this is actually much uh, can work. You know, maybe factor two or three faster because you don't have to. The box Mueller transform had like a sine and a square root, and I think, or or I had a log, right? So if you do this, it's much easier to actually calculate. Um, so there's people have been kind of um, doing a lot of, of um, relaxing on what was needed in order to get this to work, and now you know they to some extent understand you can just do this and it still works. So. Okay, so th this is great if you if you uh, don't want to look at the data ahead of time because maybe you want to prepare it, you haven't seen your data yet, um, or. Um, and you're willing to go to say 200 dimensions, but if you want to get down to two or three dimensions, you should probably, you know, wait to see your data and use PCA or use one of the faster techniques I talked about um, on Monday, and that'll give you a better low-dimensional projection. It won't satisfy all of the distances like this, but it'll satisfy most of the distances pretty well. Um, so there's, uh, you know, uh, there's some trade-offs. So I, I used to talk about this, I talked about this more in detail last year when I taught the class, but this one reps one squared term really bugs me in that you, it takes a lot of dimensions to get high accuracy. So um, in, in practice, people don't use this that much. In theory, people love this. Um, they say, oh, that's a constant. Right? It's a constant that's 100, or it's 10,000, right? So that's, that's not a good constant, I think. There's actually another constant inside of here too, right? But but this the other the constant inside the big O is is part of like one or something. It's I, I don't remember what it is. It's between one half and two, I think. But so, so don't worry about that one. But worry about the one around one squared. Okay. Uh, okay. So now I'm going to talk about something which is kind of completely different. Um, and is the reason I have it in here is it's one of the kind of very active areas related to data mining that I think you should kind of be aware of and know about. And I'm going to describe kind of a very simple version of it and give you insight into kind of what this whole community is doing. Um, and this actually didn't grow up out of like the computer science side of uh, data mining, but people working in signal processing and electrical engineering. Um, and this is called compressed. Um, um, sensing. So, has anyone heard of compressed sensing? Okay. So, um, so the, the 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 basic idea behind this and what really motivated the work was, um, if you. Um, if you think of a camera, right? So a camera, you know, now modern day cameras, even pretty cheap ones, maybe even in your phone, 
is going to have 10 gigapixels. Right? So I, I, I don't even know how many actual pixels that is. The giga is probably like a million or something. Or is it bigger? Okay, 10 megapixels. That's still big, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, so how many, how many pixels is that? 10 million. 10 million. Okay, good. If it was small, it would, it would, it would ruin my point. Um, <laughs> but, um, I mean, th th this is one of the motivations for working on this, so I knew it was a big something. Okay, but, but then what you do is, when you store this picture, um, you probably store it as a, as a JPEG, unless you're someone who likes to work with RAW. Um, then you probably have to deal with all this, and it's much bigger, right? But most people work with, with JPEGs, and JPEG is going to be like 2 megabytes, right? Or maybe 20 megabytes. I don't know what it is. It depends on the number of colors in the picture. Okay, yeah, so it depends on something, but it's really down to 20 megabytes, which is much smaller than the number storing every one of these pixels, right? So if your camera, and most, a lot of cameras now automatically convert the picture, they never go through RAW, there's a chip that converts it straight to this JPEG. So if, why do we need all these pixels if we're going to this 20 megabyte representation? Why can't we just use like the equivalent number of pixels here to, to, uh, to somehow capture this image? Uh, it does some processing and then you do quality reprocessing and then they right. So I'm losing some. I'm losing some quality, right? Um, but why can't I just directly sense with a little bit lower quality and get out the JPEG? Or alternatively, why can't I get some ultra high quality thing that uses as much space as these 10 megapixels? But really, the 10 megapixels are still there, right? They're just kind of compressed and stored in it. Well, and there's it, some loss. Um, the JPEG is um, the JPEG is lost, lost so it's losing lost. something, right? Yeah. But why can't I say I want the resolution? The, I I want to store a JPEG that was the size of the raw image, and then I want to sense that, right? right? And I and I, I have these 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 10 million sensors on the camera. I want to store them so I use all the information and I use all that resolution in the camera the thing I've captured, right? So th th this is the idea. How do we directly use all of these, or use all, so how do we use much fewer um, um, kind of uh, sensors to get the same quality image as the JPEG that we store? Well, how do we send something that is that can get the quality of a compressed representation? Okay, so, so how does this actually work? So, so people have actually built uh, these things called a single, um, single pixel um, uh, uh, what's called a single pixel camera. And so it's a camera that has one pixel and it takes a bunch of pictures in very, of maybe a still scene. Um, so it's not moving. It takes, but only on the order of the size of the JPEG. It only takes this many <coughs> pictures, but it gets out something to the resolution as if you took it with 10, um, with 10 million um, individual pixels. So it resolves it up to the level of detail of the 10 million pixels, um, but it only takes as many sensing readings as of the size of the JPEG. And so how this works, and it, and it only takes, so you can think of just being one pixel, you could have taken a bunch of these different pixels all at once too, but it's, it's kind of, it really drives the point home and it really only has one sensor, it just does repeat it. And so what, what it does is, is each, so, so it, so, so what is 20 megabytes, what is this, 20, um, oh, two meg, two million, right? What, two, so, million. Four, two, to e to the six, right? Yeah. Well, it Lights. should be. I don't know. Maybe let's say it's twenty thousand. Okay. What? It's a million bytes. Okay, but but each of the pixels is capturing much more than a single byte to make my. So so it's going to be four bytes, right? So 
Uh, okay, so um, so let's say that this is okay. Well, let's just say it's two hundred thousand. It's a, uh, these actual numbers aren't going to matter so much. Um, but it's, so this, so let's say this number of measurements is going to be t, and so for for i equals one to t, um, what it's going to do is it's going to take it's, it's going to take one image of the picture, but it's going to pre it's going to think of all of these. So, so, so it's going to think of a grid that has these ten um, these ten million pixels, and randomly it's going to black out uh, um, about half of these um, about half these pixels. So it's going to have a random mask. So, so, so this is going to be a um, random mass of the whole image. And it's going to look at how much light is passing through. And it, you could think of doing this for each color if you cared about the different colors. But if it's black and white, it has a certain intensity which passes through this, this random mass. And this comes out um, to be one value, yi which is the amount of intensity that goes through this, this random mask, where half of them are, are black. Then. You can actually think of, it, it actually makes more sense to be um, half of them being, or a third of them being blacked out. So it's going to be um, um, one third is going to be zero, one third is going to be minus one, and one third is going to be plus one. Where, so the plus one means it comes through as is, Minus one means it's kind of flipping the signal. And what this allows you to do is to uh, um, get it so the, you, ex you expect that the measurement is going to be zero if it was uh, um, um, based on the image. Because the zeros have no effect, and you're summing all, all of these things up. Uh, the plus ones are, are adding, you see something that's bright, you plus one. For these, if it's a negative one, you see something that's bright, you actually take values away. Um, so mathematically, this will be similar to talk about. But from the picture, you can kind of normalize them afterwards and just think of, I'm blacking out half of the pixels and keeping half of them, half of them open. Um, and you can renormalize it so it looks kind of like this. Yeah. So I'm still having a little bit of difficulty understanding. If I understand correctly, what it does is, once it takes the, the raw image, the, the picture, the, the 10 megabyte camera, 